In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Salaamu Alaikum and welcome to Islam. What is nature? A creation from God or part of an evolutionary process? Let's join Dr. Fazlur Rahman of the University of Chicago as he discusses this issue with a group of Muslims. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the present session, we are going to discuss the theme of nature as it is presented in the Quran. And uh, although the subject is very vast, I shall uh, present its essential aspects here. For the Quran, God created some kind of a lump. It is in the Quran. It says the heavens and the earth kanata ratkan. They were a lump in the beginning. Fafataqna huma, and then we separated that lump and expanded it into a cosmos. As I say, there are various aspects of this question, like evolution and so on, which we may go into later on. But here, I want to uh, bring to your attention the basic fact that the that nature for the Quran is one integrated huge machine working according to its own laws. The idea that the Quran presents is that God, whenever he creates something, he also puts the laws of behavior of that thing into it. He does two things, khalq, creation, and amr, the command, which is put into the thing, and whereby it uh, forms itself into the pattern of the whole and does not stand outside as something jarring. So the whole uh, universe is a cosmos and not a chaos because of this. God presides over this entire uh, universe, this entire physical system, and uh, he gives his commands to natural objects when he creates them so that they go on behaving uh, as a whole in a pattern. Now, in Surat al-Mulk, the Quran says, look at these heavens and this earth, you will find no gaps, no dislocations there. It's all one integrated, smoothly working physical system. Of course, God has a purpose through, that works through the uh, physical movement of the system. But the fact is that so far as physical inquiries of the physicist uh, and other scientists are concerned, nature is one natural, well-knit, integrated unit. Now, if nature is that kind of a unit in which there are no gaps, uh, in which there are no discontinuities, in which there is nothing that is unpredictable once you know the laws, then what becomes of the doctrine of miracles which have been so prominent in the history of religions? Because a miracle has been defined as a temporary interference or suspension of the laws of nature. Now, of course, the Quran is insistent that if God wants, he can interfere in nature because he has created this nature, this lump which then he has been unfolding, it, or rather it has been unfolding itself under the impact of his continuous command, his continuous amr, then if through miracle, miraculous happenings, things become unpredictable, then what happens? Uh, the Quran, of course, says that uh, miracles have sometimes occurred. 
at the hands of earlier prophets like Ibrahim salam, Musa and Isa salam, and so on. When the Prophet salam, was pressed for miracles by his opponents, the Quran said, this I am the miracle of Muhammad, produce anything like me. Even if all you human beings get together, you cannot produce one thing like me. But as for supernatural miracles, the Quran says in Surah Al-Isra, it says miracles belonged to the time of the immaturity of mankind. Since mankind has become mature, miracles are not sent by God. And there is a verse, I think verse 33 in Surah Al-An'am, which is rather strongly worded. It uh, says to the Prophet, you still want miracles? Uh, if you can climb up to the heavens by a ladder or seek out in a hole in the earth, bring them some miracle. These are the words of the Quran. So the Quran asked the Prophet in some strong language not to ask for miracles, but to tell those people who were, asked, who were demanding miracles from him to stop making this demand because the, the human spirit or the human mind had uh, passed that period of early transition of infancy and had become mature so that no so this miracles... This spiritual will, evolution you are talking about now. There is, a, there is an evolution in the history of religions itself. I see. Yes. And that is the what the Quran is pointing to here. Uh, this shows us, you see, that the Quran does believe that there was a period of uh, on that passed on man when he was immature. He was in his not only intellectual but spiritual infancy and uh, that slowly he has become mature. Uh, there was also the problem of how to distinguish uh, sorcery from miracles, for example. And the Quran says that many people confuse the two. And uh, therefore this, this whole thing, the Quran has, uh, God has now finished for good. There will be no miracles ever in history. And the universe will go on working for mankind as it has done before. Now, of course, the universe has been created by God for man. This we must never forget. Well, what there is are, the purpose though of creation? Pardon? What is the purpose of creation? The purpose of creation is to make man realize his potentialities as man. Uh, now, what those potentialities are, uh, man has two essential characteristics that, that differentiate him from lower animals. One is that he is endowed with intelligence. This kind of intelligence no other being possesses. Now based on that intelligence he has this sense of responsibility which no other being possesses either. Angels do not have any sense of responsibility. They are automatic, automatic vehicles of carrying out God, come on, God's commands. And so is nature. So neither of them has any will of it of their own. Uh, man alone is the creature, the creature who is responsible in the universe. And it is his uh, responsibility to develop his potentiality and prepare himself for what the Quran calls Akhira that we'll have to discuss in a separate session. What is this Akhira for which uh, man has to prepare himself and discharge his responsibility? This also touches on the question of evolution, but we'll discuss it, inshallah, in the next uh, session. Yes, Dr. Rahman, I think if I understand you correctly, you're speaking of nature in the sense that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But my concern is that human nature is to take this fact for granted. Is, is this the kind of nature that you're speaking of, the control that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has on all of us? Very good question. The Quran in connection with nature itself speaks very frequently of its regularity. Uh, the sun rises and sets, other stars rise and set, 
the moon rises and Saturn each each moves within its own orbit the Quran says neither no, neither none of these stars can overtake the others in its movement now this regularity the Quran stresses because the in the view of the Quran it is the regularity of nature that points to God if there were chaos it won't point to God because there is a system in the universe there's a regularity it points to God now the first uh, point to note about this is that uh, God who has created this system of course he can upset this also I said it in my last session also but the Quran says that so far as man is concerned his earthly life is concerned this system is there he has to believe that it will go on but the second point is that the Quran constantly complains that man should because of this regularity and serviceability of nature to his ends should be thankful to God this is why the Quran calls the universe an ayah the great ayah the great sign the great proof of God but it complains constantly that man gets absorbed in nature so much that he forgets God that there is God behind that nature and it gives several telling examples it for example says that uh, when a ship is sailing and uh, the weather is comfortable uh, the weather is appropriate the seas are calm at that time men quote get lost in nature yes. and they do not think of God whereas this regularity ought to teach them that there is God behind this system but they get absorbed in nature so much that they forget all about God but once these a storm should arise and angry waves should strike against the ship then they will think of God yes. man think, yeah, in other words man thinks of God only in moments of helplessness not when nature works for him mm -hmm. but when nature breaks down for him then he thinks of nature so I would say that the system number one is made for man because the Quran insists in about a dozen verses that this whole universe has been created for the use of man therefore the Quran exhorts constantly look at this universe study it use it for your good ends secondly that the that the that God who brought this universe into being in the first place has the power to upset it also yes but human beings tend to think that they themselves control their own lives and they forget that that the maker is controlling their life again very good question when I when man learned in his uh, old days earlier days how to for example bring up a sapling of a grape tree and once he was able to do that he began to think that he does it this question is addressed by the Quran in Surah 6, Surah Al-An'am. The Quran says, look at these plants. You grow them? Or do we grow them? Does God grow them? All you do is you learn about the natural processes and you use those laws that you learn and you think you are doing it, but you are not doing it. It's God who has put those powers and capacities and potentialities and things which you are of course uh, you can utilize you can uh, exploit them because of your intelligence but you didn't make them yes. it's Dr. God Ramadan, who made them I have a question regarding that there is a perfect universe that God created by God yes and upon this perfect universe you put down somewhat imperfect members like human beings yes. what is this sense of responsibility and what's the mechanism by which man can coexist with this perfection yes very basic question I would say the God created nature and the Quran repeats in several places that this nature is Muslim you know uh, Islam means to obey God's laws and 
thereby to secure integrality and wholeness for oneself, not to disintegrate. Because if you go against the laws of God, you will disintegrate. Okay, this is what Islam means. Now, because nature works and works integrally, so the Quran calls it Muslim. It obeys the, God, the laws of God that have been ingrained in it. Now, but nature is Muslim in an involuntary sense. It cannot help its Islam. God wanted a creature who has the capacity to perfect himself. Nature is born perfect. There is nothing there to perfect it. But, and angels of course are there as automatic obedient agents of God. So God, when he said to angels, I want to put my vice gerent, my assistant on this earth, what he wanted to say was, what he was saying was that I want a being who can develop himself. With a sense of responsibility. With a sense of responsibility. Now, he gave Adam the power of knowledge. You remember in that passage, uh, God brings Adam and angels together and he asks angels, tell me the names of these things. And they say, sir, sorry, we don't know the names of these things. And then Adam comes and he names things, that is to say he displays his a creative capacity for knowledge. That's where, that is what distinguishes man from the rest of nature. But the Quran therefore affirms that man has this tremendous capacity for creative knowledge. The other thing that he ought to develop on the basis of this knowledge is his sense of responsibility, which he so far hasn't done very well with. This is the complaint of the Quran. In the moral sphere, man has so far not succeeded. And this is the point to which the penultimate verse of uh, Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah 33 refers, where the Quran says, uh, God presented his trust to the uh, stars and mountains and heavens and everything and they refused to accept that trust. They thought it was too frightening, too heavy. But man came forward and he accepted and man is a bit foolhardy, the Quran says. He has not really discharged what he accepted. Let's join Nasiha now with her segment, Islam at a Glance. Belief in one God and a just social and economic moral order is the essential impulse of the Quran. The Quran is a teaching primarily interested in producing the right moral attitude and action for not only an individual or for society, but for entire mankind. The correct action, whether it be political, religious, or social, it considers to be ibada or the service of God. If one considers the meaning of the word Islam, it becomes more understandable that implied in the word Islam and its meaning is the basic practicing principle of Islam, and that is the determination to infuse into the physical texture of the world the command of God or the moral imperative. This implementation, as mentioned earlier, constitutes service to God or ibadah. The action in Islam, which is considered ibadah or worship, is geared totally toward the betterment of society. The fundamental basis of the social solution that Islam has is first to clarify and emphasize man's relationship to God. Though man was created out of dust, yet he was given the position of being God's vice-regent. This implies a great deal of trust that Allah or God has invested in man. Similarly, it also implies a great deal of responsibility that man has been entrusted with. As a direct corollary to this interaction, a very direct system of accountability to God and the promise of the hereafter is evolved and becomes the motivating basis for man's actions on this earth. The Quran is very specific on this and in repeated verses man is exhorted to uphold what is right and to prevent what is wrong. This realization of man's relationship to Allah is a compelling task that man is faced with on this earth. In the process of realizing his responsibility, man has been provided with a framework of human interaction by Allah. It starts off with the direction from Allah that all human beings are but one family descended from Adam and Eve. The Quran says, O men, behold, we have created you all out of male and female, and have made you into nations and tribes. 
so that you might come to know one another. Verily, the noblest of you in the sight of God is one who is most deeply conscious of him. Behold, God is all-knowing, O all-aware. In other words, men's evolution into nations and tribes is meant to foster rather than to diminish their mutual desire to understand and appreciate the essential human oneness underlying their outward differentiations. An essential element in this interaction is equality of all human beings. This equality, which rejects any collective or individual claim of superiority over others based on color, race, ethnic origin, wealth, and social standing, acknowledges piety or the right moral action as the sole criterion on which human beings would be judged. Islam therefore teaches the sanctity of the human personality, confers equal rights on all without distinction of color, sex or race, and subjects the richest and the poor, the king and the commoner, to the sovereignty of Allah. This concept of equality is thus a complete one. It is not merely a legal concept, but based firmly on morality, for no man can read the heart of another. Hence, as far as we are concerned, here on this earth all men are equal before God and before the laws which he has set down. This concept of equality is loaded with emotion. With the true feeling, this equality springs from brotherhood, and it is this emotional sincerity which should guide men's relationship to his fellow man in society. Indeed, we see just that in the statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Truly, not one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Whoever relieves a human being from a grief of this world, God will relieve him from a grief of the hereafter. This last hadith, or prophetic tradition, impresses upon us another very important principle which guides social interaction in Islam. It states that he who relieves a human being, God shall give him relief. The principle here is that interactions between men are really interactions with God. Hence. A man does not act toward another man, rather his actions are toward God in relation to other men. All social interactions in Islam are seen in this light. They include the interactions between parents and children, husbands and wives, fellow human beings. In short, all level of social interactions, as illustrated in the Prophet's final message during the farewell pilgrimage, your lives and properties are sacred and inviolable amongst one another until you appear before the Lord. And remember that you shall have to appear before your Lord who shall demand from you an account of all your actions. O people, you have rights over your wives and your wives have rights over you. Treat your wives with love and kindness. Verily, you have married them as the trust of God and have made their persons lawful unto you by the words of God. Keep always faithful to the trust reposed in you and avoid sins. These are the words of the Prophet Muhammad's farewell sermon delivered to the Muslims 1400 years ago. In it, he impresses for all time that those who submit their will to God heed him in all their actions and all their obligations. This is the core of Islam's social life and upon this, all else is built. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wal-adiyati dabha Fal-muriyati qadha Fal-mughirati subha فأثرنا به نقعا فوسطنا به جمعا إن الإنسان لربه لكنود وإنه على ذلك لشهيد وإنه لحب الخير لشديد أفلا يعلم إذا بعثر ما في القبور 
وَحُسِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَخَبِيرٌ صدق الله العظيم In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. By the steeds that run with panting breath and strike sparks of fire and push home the charge in the morning and raise the dust in clouds the while and penetrate forthwith into the midst of the foe. Truly man is to his Lord ungrateful and to that fact he bears witness by his deeds and violent is he in his love of wealth. Does he not know when that which is in the graves is scattered abroad and that which is locked up in human breasts is made manifest that their Lord has been well acquainted with them even to that day. On behalf of the Islamic Information Service, we do thank you for watching and please be sure to watch us again next time. Assalamu alaikum.